first met and that began collaborating. And three years ago, he went, actually, about two years ago, he went to Cornell, where he's a postdoc now. It's one of the uh, more most important people in the Caltech Cornell Relativity Collaboration, who's actually doing a, a lot of the real work that's done in the science work that's being done. And today, he'll be telling us about the micro simulations of binary black holes with the nearly extreme of steps. Okay, so uh, let me start out by just talking about a little bit of the, laying a bit of the background. Uh, no, normally, I spend all my time thinking about vacuum space times, but uh, but uh, matter is one of the big motivations for looking at black holes with high spins. And this is because uh, it turns out that just by merging black holes together, it's actually fairly difficult to get them to spin very fast. So if there actually are black holes that are spinning. Uh, that are spinning very fast in the real universe, uh, the way that they would acquire their spins is by accreting matter. And, and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty of about exactly how fast black holes really spin. It depends on uh, what model of accretion disk you want to believe in. Basically, if the disks are thinner, then uh, the spins tend to be higher. But uh, a lot of you might be more experts about that kind of thing than me. But as long as there's the prospect of, the, of black holes having high spins, and maybe even most of them having high spins, where I, where I mean spins that are higher, close to one in dimensionless units, then we'd like to look for black holes like this. Uh, when two black holes merge, they'll emit gravitational waves, and detectors like LIGO will then, will then try to look for them. And uh, this gives us the chance to directly probe the strongly curved space-time around these holes and maybe learn something about the spins, maybe settle this, this question of how fast black holes spin. Um, but to, to do this, uh, we need numerical simulations. And I'll say more about this later, but the basic idea is that uh, the space-time gets sufficiently uh, turbulent during the merger that there just aren't any analytic approximations that you can use. So uh, let's see. Uh, so these, uh, since about 2000, I don't know, 2005 or 2006, uh, we've, several groups have been able to simulate binary black holes that spiral together, merge, and then ring down. Um, but the case of spins that are close to one is still challenging. And so I want to talk today about some of the things that make this uh, more difficult and some of the ways you might be able to address it. Let me start out by saying a little bit about black hole spins and what I'm exactly I mean by black hole spin. Um, uh, the dimensionless spin uh, is just the spin divided by the mass of the black hole squared. Um, and uh, for a single black hole, this, uh, the mass of the hole is unambiguously defined. For binary black holes, I'm uh, defining this mass of the black hole this, in, in terms of this. This is called the Christodoulou mass. This is just uh, the sum of, it's basically uh, this aerial mass squared plus this term according to the spin. And this is chosen just so that for a Kerr black hole, this reduces to the usual thing you think of when you think of mass. Um, the trickiness about this definition, though, is if you go through a little bit of algebra, you can show that just this is mathematically trivially bounded between 0 and 1. So no matter what the actual space-time looks like, you're not going to be able to uh, ever make spa a space-time where this spin parameter chi, which is usually what you think of when you think of the spin, is bigger than 1. So there's another uh, way you can normalize the spin, and that's uh, called this extremality parameter. And the idea there is you just divide it by the aerial mass squared directly. And for a Kerr black hole, this is bounded, and it won't be, uh, uh, and it won't be less than 1. But for other space times, you could conceivably have an, a super extremal solution. So when I talk about the dimensionless spin of a black hole, unless it, I'm usually going to be talking about this one, but when I get near spins that are really close to one, uh, I'll also show this extremality parameter. Now, uh, a couple more th things I want to say before I go any farther into the talk is I want to give you an idea of how to picture these black holes that are spinning. Uh, these are the horizons of two black holes. This one is not spinning, and this one has a spin of 0.8. And they're ju I just embedded them in flat space. So the idea is uh, the non-spinning black hole has a spherical horizon, whereas 
the spinning black hole has a horizon that's squashed at the poles and bulges at the equator. Um, it's, uh, you can't embed a black hole that's spinning faster than about 0.86 in flat space, though. So for this talk, I'm really not going to be using embedding diagrams much. Instead, I'd like to visualize the horizon spins by looking at the horizon's shape. In particular, I'm going to look at the scalar curvature of the horizons. So uh, for any two-dimensional surface, if you take its metric and then compute its Ricci scalar, that scalar curvature tells you everything about the shape of the horizon. There's the same amount of information as there is in this embedding diagram. So the non-spinning black hole has a constant scalar curvature of one half in dimensionless units, whereas the spinning black hole has a scalar curvature that's positive at the equator, which means that it's bulging, and is squashed at the poles. And that's why the scalar curvature is shown with blue there. So I'll be showing some movies later on in the talk where I'm coloring the horizons by the scalar curvature. And this curvature tells you the shape independent of the coordinates of how the horizon actually is. So I've drawn both of these horizons as a sphere, but, the sh but this horizon actually has a non-constant curvature, whereas this one is a constant curvature. OK, so in, in, in order to further motivate looking at spinning black holes, let me say a little bit about what difference spin actually makes when you have two black holes that are spiraling together and merging. Uh, uh, one big qualitative difference is this idea of or the orbital hang-up. So what this means is uh, if you've got some black hole with some orbital angular momentum uh, and you have two different configurations, one where the spins of the black holes are pointing parallel to the orbital angular momentum. Here they're both pointing out of the screen. Uh, and you have another case where the spins are pointing the opposite direction. So here the spins are pointing into the screen, but the orbital angular momentum is still pointing in the same direction. Then that qualitatively changes the trajectories that you see. So this is a, a simulation that Tony Chu, a grad student at Caltech, has done um, for the case on the left where the spins are parallel to the orbital angular momentum. And here's the same uh, simulation on the right uh, for the case where the spins are anti-parallel. And if you look towards the middle here, you see there are a lot more orbits on this left-hand plot than on the right. And actually, uh, starting from the same separation with the same masses and same spin magnitudes, the black holes, when the spins are aligned, actually take, I think it's about six more orbits before they, the common horizon forms. So uh, by changing the, the number of orbits by this much, it's not, it shouldn't be surprising that the, then the gravitational wave signal that gets emitted from these two cases will be quite different. Now another thing, which I talked about a little bit over lunch, that spin can, can do uh, is it can uh, lead to a recoil of the final black hole. So this is just a head-on collision of two black holes. Here they fall together, then they merge, uh, then the common horizon rings for a bit, settles down, and mostly the black holes just fall together like you see here. But here I'm plotting the velocity in the direction uh, tangent to the, well, it's, it's normal to the, the bulk of the motion and also normal to the spins, which are in the z direction. And you see as the holes are falling together, uh, they're actually accelerating each other's downwards. You can think of that as the whole spin is just dragging the space around it in a circle. So this spin over here pulls this, the hole on the left downwards and vice versa. And the last, last thing I want to mention is uh, this, uh, more than just this hang up, uh, the, the spin can actually cause the orbits to just uh, to just process out of the equatorial plane and it can cause the spins to process. So the initial configuration here, this is just, these are just uh, unit vectors pointing in the directions of this initial spin of, the, of one hole and then the other hole. The green one's going to end up being twice as heavy, uh, twice as massive as the red one. And then here's the initial orbital angular momentum direction. And here's a movie of, the, of, the, of this. You can see the uh, the two black holes are colored by their scalar curvature, and the equatorial plane, z equals zero, is shown as this transparent gray sphere to try to give you an idea of the three-dimensional motion as the holes go up and down uh, above and below the equatorial plane. This is a plot of what the trajectories look like. Uh, the, and, you can, you, and again, I'm showing this equatorial plane as this translucent s uh, square. Uh, so the, uh, the holes don't stay in the equatorial plane, the, the, and and, the, and instead they're processing. 
Up here, I'm plotting the uh, two curves. Maybe this red one's a little bit hard to see. These curves are showing how the direction of the spin's unit vector of each hole processes. Uh, if you keep your eye on one of the holes in the movie, you can also see the, the spins coming around. The spin of the, of the, thanks, the, spin of the lighter hole travel, travels around for a bit more than a period, whereas you see about half a period of spin precession of the, of the heavier hole. So these kinds of qualitative effects that spin uh, has on binary black hole evolutions means that's, that it's important to be able to simulate it. And since there's the possibility that black hole spins can be very large, uh, then it's important to be able to simulate spins that are close to one. But this turns out to be, uh, this turns out to be difficult. Okay, let me just say a little bit about the, why we need these numerical simulations before I go on to the specific high spin case. This is sort of the Caltech, Cornell, and Cetus showcase movie. I'm showing the, uh, this is a, two black holes with no spin spiraling together. Uh, the, the, whole, the horizons and the trajectories are shown up on the top and then the curvature of the space-time is shown uh, in the middle, and then the gravitational waveform is shown down here. During the in-spiral of two black holes, the, you don't really need to do a numerical simulation uh, for, the, for, for most of the in-spiral because you can approximate the in-spiral using post-Newtonian theory. This is actually what the gravitational wave templates that LIGO uses to look for waves are, are, are using right now. They're only just starting to look at uh, combining these with... Uh, uh, with numerical waves. But right at the merger, the space-time gets really turbulent. And, uh, and, so, and so you need to use numerical simulations because there is no analytic approximation. Here's just another view of this. I'm just showing the two horizons falling together. Uh, the black, for those of you who know, the, the black is the event horizon, and then the red surfaces are these, uh, are the apparent horizons. I don't want to go into the distinction between the two too much. I just want to say that during the ring down after the holes have merged, you can again model the problem using perturbation theory just like a good bit before they merge, but it's this point right in the middle where they're just, it's just too nonlinear and there just isn't a solution that you can get using analytic methods and you have to use these numerical simulations. Okay, so, so why are, are nearly extremal spins more difficult? Well, one, one thing that the simulations need is they need initial data and this initial data uh, isn't trivial to set up. You have to choose the data to satisfy the Einstein equations initially and also have the physical properties that you want. And another trickiness is that uh, computers don't like infinities much, but these black holes all have singularities inside them. So you have to have a way of keeping the singularities uh, off of your computational grid so that the computer doesn't complain about that. <coughs> and one last thing that I want to say is when black holes get really high spin, you tend to need a lot more spatial resolution in order to, in, in order to get the same level of accuracy. And this has, to, and this has uh, the effect that the simulations run more slowly. And besides just uh, what you would expect, having more grid points causing the simulation to run slowly, this also causes simula the simulations to take s uh, smaller steps in time when you carve the space time up uh, into a series of frames and then step from frame to frame. The time interval between the frames is much smaller uh, at higher resolutions normally. And I'll say more about why that is and how you might get around it later on. Another thing about the high resolution requirement I might mention is this is a, this is a case when the spectral methods like the, that the Caltech Cornell CETA code uses are really nice because these tend to, uh, so you can imagine a spectral method is just taking a, uh, you take the solution of some function you want, and 1D might be some function, and then you expand it and, and say it's a combination of some coefficients times some basis functions that you know. This lets you do things like take spatial derivatives analytically. The nice thing about these is so long as the solution is smooth, you, the, uh, the accuracy of the function uh, tends to improve exponentially with, uh, with resolution. So, uh, the, so most of the numerical relativity simulations out there colliding black holes uh, don't use the spectral methods. They use uh, finite difference methods, and they tend to converge just as a polynomial with, with accuracy. So for the high spin case, we would expect that uh, the, the spectral simulations would do well, and that motivates us using the spectral code for this. All of the simulations I'm going to use in this talk use this uh, Caltech Cornell CETA code that I talked about called SPEC, which is developed mostly by 
Harold, and then by Larry Kidder at Cornell and Mark Scheele at Caltech. Uh, experimentalists always put these pictures of their machines in their talks, so I wanted to just show you. This is the computer that I've actually been running the simulations on at Caltech. That's a part of it. That's a part of it. I thought, oh, I guess it's gotten bigger since I took this There's picture. Yeah, it was only one rack when I took the picture, but I guess it's gotten bigger now. Yes? for a second. I mean, it's certainly the, the kind of resolution you need depends on your coordinates. Uh, if you're doing a spectral expansion, say, and you represent the angular part of the solution near the horizons in spherical harmonics, if you use spheroidal harmonics, you're going to better approximate the spin, and so you would need less resolution than you would otherwise. So there certainly is a coordinate dependence to it. Uh, is there a coordinate independent way of saying how much resolution you need. Uh, yeah, I don't really, I'd have, to, I'd have to think about that because just what you mean by resolution is where you're putting your coordinates. I mean, I, I, I think you could say yes because things like, uh, well, so the horizon is more deformed and its scalar curvature is, is uh, and its scalar curvature is changing on the, uh, more sharply than it would be. Uh, for the lower spins. There's, there's more yes, the yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it's bulging more at the equator and squash more at the poles. And so if the, t the length scale that the scalar curvature is changing goes down, then that means that you're going to need more spatial resolution to resolve the derivatives. So yeah, okay. But I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that before. It's a good question. Okay. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm actually going to just address these three these three issues. Each of these has some peculiarity with uh, nearly extremal spins that makes them harder to that makes them harder to simulate than uh, than the lower spin case, which uh, lots of groups have been able to do. Um, I'm going to first talk about initial data and how to make initial data for black holes with high spins. And then I'll talk about uh, evolutions, and in particular, I'm going to focus on this issue of excising the singularities. And finally, I'll talk about getting around this. Uh, limitation in the time step size that k kicks in when you get to really high spatial resolutions. Okay, so this is a basic idea of initial data. You have some space-time metric, uh, but evolving a four-dimensional space-time, solving for a four-dimensional space-time all at once is hard. So what we tend to do uh, is decompose this into a series of three-dimensional spaces and then evolve the three-dimensional space and time. So you can think of each spatial slice as like the frame in a movie. To start out the simulation, um, you need to specify initial data, and this initial data includes the intrinsic metric of the space, so this, this describes the internal geometry, and you also need to specify it's basically the first derivative of the metric nor in the normal direction, so how is the metric uh, embedded in this, the space embedded in this space time. These two quantities together tell you what you need to know to start the evolution. Except when you're doing things numerically, you need to lay down coordinates, and so you also need to know you also need to know how the coordinates move between this slice and this one. So if these two points have the same coordinates, then the vector connecting them defines a, a lapse and then a, and, and a shift. And these these uh, this vector and scalar together are the four coordinate degrees of freedom in the problem. So choosing an initial lapse shift and then uh, metric and extrinsic curvature lets you run some evolution code to take time t to time t plus delta t, and then you can keep stepping through the space time. Okay. But you can't just choose any metric and extrinsic curvature that you like. The metric and extrinsic curvature have to solve the Einstein constraint equations. You can think of this just like electromagnetism in vacuum. You can't just start out evolving any electric and magnetic fields that you want. The electric and magnetic fields have to satisfy constraint equations that uh, the divergence is zero in vacuum. So uh, the art of this is finding a way to construct initial data where you choose freely uh, the properties that you want, but then you can't choose everything. You still have to make sure that your data solves these constraint equations. 
Uh, one way that this is commonly done is this conformal decomposition, where you say the initial metric is proportional to some conformal metric, g tilde, that you just choose to be whatever you like. This doesn't have to satisfy any constraint equations or anything. And then you'll solve for the conformal factor by solving uh, these initial data equations. The simplest way to do this is to make the metric conformally flat, where the, the metric's just proportional to the flat metric. When you do that, it turns out that you can solve these constraint equations analytically for the extrinsic curvature, and then you only have a single uh, initial data equation to solve for this conformal factor. So that's a lot easier to do than to solve these, uh, these coupled initial data equations together, and so that's what almost everyone does. The downside for the high spin case is that you can prove analytically that you can't make a black, ho black holes that are in equilibrium that have spin. Even if, uh, even a single black hole, let alone two black holes together, if you try to make it conformally flat and try to put spin on it, then the black hole won't be in equilibrium and it'll be perturbed. And as it relaxes, then the spin will change. So let me show you how this works. Uh, this is, this is what happens for a single black hole, or if you want to think of it as two black holes that are really far apart, when you try to uh, run a simulation that starts out with initial data that's conformally flat. Uh, what I'm plotting here on this horizontal axis is the spin that you end up with after this initial relaxation from the initial data being perturbed. And what I'm plotting on the vertical axis is how much the spin has fallen. So for small spins, spin 0.5, the, sp the spin isn't going to decrease by more than uh, by even a percent. Uh, but as the spin increases, then this problem gets w uh, worse and worse until you get to the end here. Uh, the highest spin you can make using this bow in New York uh, data is uh, 0.93, but it's uh, after the relaxation, but it's actually fallen from about 0.98 before the relaxation. So if you want to make spins that are close to one, this bow and York data isn't going to work even for single black holes or holes that are really far apart. For realistic simulations of binaries, this is, uh, this is the uh, best result that I'm aware of in the literature right now. Uh, this is uh, uh, black holes. These started at, they started at spin of 0.96, something about 0.97. Um, but very soon into the simulation, here the, the time in units of the total mass is just about, about 10 when they start their graph. The spin's fallen down to about 0.925. What's the manifestation Yeah, so, so for all of these initial data methods that satisfy the constraint equations, the holes are perturbed. And as they relax, there's some gravitational radiation emitted. It's not astrophysical, but uh, it's just a consequence of how you started the simulation. Uh, the holes will absorb some energy as they relax, and so the mass goes up. And because the mass goes up, the dimensionless spin goes down. So that's physically why this, why this is happening. Okay. So what do I, what is? Okay. So let me talk about how to make initial data with spin. So the uh, the way uh, uh, the way that the spin is set in the initial data is uh, you're solving equations on some initial spatial slice, and there's a boundary condition on the horizon, and basically uh, the tangential component <coughs> of this shift vector uh, is set to be proportional to the rotation vector that defines the spin, and then this constant of proportionality, this omega sub r, is b basically tuned to, to adjust the spin. So here's how this looks when you make conformally flat initial data. Um, this is uh, this is not the Bowen York data. This is uh, this is made using the uh, if you know the lingo, this, these are the conformal thin sandwich equations. Um, but this data still still has the metric, spatial metric conformal metric proportion is just the conformal metric is just the flat metric. So here's what the spin parameter does and here's what the extremality does. One curious thing about this is for this, uh, this initial data, uh, for the exact same parameters in the initial data, there are actually two different solutions. The initial data formalism that I'm using, these extended conformal thin sandwich equations, turn out to be non-unique non here. Um, the s s upper branch tends to be very dynamic and uh, really far from equilibrium. So they're not the kinds of things you want to do astrophysical simulations. So the highest you can get on the lower branch in terms of spin is about 0.8, and the extremality doesn't get much above 0.4. And even on the upper branch, these max out 
these max out below one. So now let me show you another conformal metric you can use instead. Uh, this metric is, the f is conformally flat plus these extra terms that uh, where this metric here is basically a, the metric of a s boosted spinning black hole with some spin. And these Gaussians here are thrown on there so that the metric is conformally flat almost everywhere. But just in the vicinity of each black hole, uh, the conformal metric is, cur is curved. When you do this, you get a much different picture. Um, so uh, I'm showing two initial data sets here for two different values of the spin that I put into the conformal metric. 0.93 in green, 0.93 are the dashed lines and 0.99 are the solid lines. And again, the green is the s dimensionless spin parameter and the red is the extremality. So if you, if you zoom in here, the, the dimensionless spin goes all really, really close to one and the uh, the extremality also gets quite a bit higher than it gets in the conformally flat case. So let me zoom in and show you m closer how, what's happening here. This is the spin. It's very close to one, but then this is trivially bounded by one. But here's the extremality, and the extremality also gets close to one. Uh, so let me say what these two different curves are. Um, when we solve the initial data, <coughs> I said that we put these boundary conditions on the horizon. Well, um, what we really are doing is we're taking some domain that, and we cut out regions around the singularity, and I'll say more about that later. But the surface, the excision surface, uh, is the horizon because we apply another boundary condition there that requires it to, that the outgoing light rays have no expansion. So, but what, what happens <coughs> when you try to solve the initial data and say, I want this surface to be a horizon, and I also want to keep cranking this parameter up to try to make higher and higher spins until eventually I try to make a black hole whose spin is super extremal, where this extremality parameter is bigger than one, is that this other surface form. So these dashed lines are this excision surface where we're requiring the initial data, where we're requiring that the surface satisfy this uh, parent horizon boundary condition. And you can keep cranking this omega uh, R up until you make a super extremal surface. So this thing spin uh, spin is super extremal on this white surface. But before that happens, it turns out that the space-time has another surface that satisfies the apparent horizon boundary condition that you didn't ask for. And this surface encloses uh, the surface that you thought was the horizon, and it has a bigger area, because it's a bigger size, and so it has a smaller dimensionless spin, and its extremality just comes up and just grazes near one and then goes back down. So. So this is the only initial data I know of where, peop where, where you can try to make a super extremal black hole. And when I tried to do it, uh, I did get a surface that satisfied the horizon boundary condition and was super extremal in spin, but it was covered by this other surface that was sub-extremal in spin. And so uh, at least for this initial data, I wasn't able to make any naked singularities. And uh, I, might, I don't know, you might speculate is what the, if this results like this if they held up for more uh, generic kinds of initial data, maybe this says something about cosmic censorship. Okay, so this SKS data, I guess I should have said what that is. That's just these uh, superposed Kerr shield. Kerr shield is the coordinates that the spinning black holes are in. This is this uh, conformally curved initial data, this should have said. So just to remind you, the spin quickly decreases from 0.98 to 0.93 using the normal conformally flat Bo and York data. Well, how well does our data do? To find out, you just have to evolve it. And this is a, a nice uh, way to transition into the next thing I want to talk about, which are evolutions. So these are two evolutions. This one is a circular in spiral. This one is a head-on plunge. They're a little bit artificial because the black holes are starting very far apart from each other. And that makes uh, this initial uh, perturbation that leads to this emission of spurious radiation and causes the spin to decrease to be less severe than it would be if the holes were closer together. But still, um, but still, these are more stringent tests than the plots I was showing for a single Bowen York black hole, where the holes would be infinitely far apart if you were treating that as binary. So in this case, the spin uh, that starts out at uh, 0.928 doesn't change except in the, in the third decimal digit, basically. Um, the rate of the spins changing is a function of resolution, and the gr this green curve is the highest resolution. So this, this slope is going to go away. And similarly, as you turn up the resolution. Now over here, uh, again, these are the three different resolutions. 
and the spin is only changing in like the, the fifth digit. But these holes are so far apart over here, 40, 44 times the total mass basically, that uh, this initial data is starting to get close to just being uh, uh, close to just analytic initial data for black holes. Okay, so that's all I want to say about initial data. And now I want to talk about evolving initial data like this, but at more realistic, closer separations. Yes? Okay. So, so, so this is, so you are not, you are not splitting it into an informal metric and a, and a formal factor. Is that, is that right? You're just, you're just putting in the metric. You're, you're just, right? No, I'm using. What are you now solving? So I'm solving the conformal thin sandwich equations. I'm still doing a conformal decomposition, but now the conformal metric isn't the flat metric. The conformal metric is the flat metric plus a superposition, weighted superposition of two black hole metrics. That's what this GN is here. So instead of conformally flat, I've got a conformal metric that tries to better represent the black hole geometry near the holes, but is still flat everywhere else. So near the holes, you're solving four equations, not, not In fact, everywhere I'm solving uh, actually five equations, because it turns out uh, besides the four constraint equations, we also solve for one of the gauge degrees of freedom. And that fifth equation is what makes these non-unique and what causes this, uh, uh, yeah, what causes this non-uniqueness I showed on this earlier, on this graph right here. But yeah, we are solving a conformal problem. And is it fair to say that the extra work in solving, as the outset, is sort of negligible relative to the actual work doing Well, that depends on what code you have. I mean, Harold has written this really good elliptic solver that can handle these five coupled uh, partial di differential equations that are pretty nonlinear. Uh, it's much easier to write an elliptic solver that just solves a single equation. Uh, so I don't know exactly how you could say which is easier. I mean, they're, they're difficult in different ways. If, uh, there, another reason why, yeah, let me just leave it at, leave it at that, I guess. So um, yeah. if we do go somewhat asymptotically, mm -hmm. uh, then there are um, angular modifications that are not current yeah. uh, in the far field. And uh, th that must be pretty basically simple to, relatively simple to solve. Yes. And you might have expected that you could do a bit of a join and get rid of most of the mismatch. Then, yeah, right? yeah, actually, that's a good, good point. And um, this hasn't, I don't think this has been done yet in practice. Um, but people have certainly written some papers talking about this. People have written down, for, inst for instance, uh, Sam Samaya uh, Isaki, who was, she was here a little while ago. Isaki, yeah. She, she, um, she worked on, uh, she wrote down a conformal metric that involved uh, these corrections to flat space in the far field that you're talking about. Uh, there was another paper that came out recently, but I don't remember who the authors were, that wrote down in somewhat different language than what I'm solving, doing here, but they basically wrote down a conformal metric that blends a metric like this for black holes to these uh, far field perturbations to try to capture the initial gravitational waves and also the curvature near the holes. But nobody, as far as I know, has ever actually tried to solve that, the constraints using that data and then evolve it. But that certainly would be interesting to do. Okay, let me come back to where I was. Okay. I think I can. Yes. How long do you think of the simulations like very large initial simulations? Yes. How long do you know how long they would want to merge? Okay, so this one is something, I think it's, I don't think it's quite 30 orbits to merger, but it's like over 20 orbits, I think around 26 orbits to merger. And how long that would run, uh, I estimated it a long time ago, I think it was not feasible, it was, it was months. Uh, uh, just to do the lower resolution run, so just because of so many, of, it would just take so many orbits and, and uh, it, it takes too long right now. This one, I think, would, wouldn't have taken as, would, would be feasible because it's a head-on collision, except you might run into some difficulty with your coordinates doing weird things because you're starting the holes so far apart. But I never actually tried to push this farther and I don't have a good feeling for how long this would take, but it certainly would take a lot less time than the one on the left. Okay, so this is the same plot I was showing before where I'm plotting the spin that the initial data relaxes to versus how far the spin has decayed due to this initial perturbation. The green curve is this Bowen-York data. 
The dashed red curve is this conformally flat data using the conformal thin sandwich equations. Uh, and it, it basically behaves not exactly the same, but pretty similarly. And then over here, these two points are two initial data sets that I was evolving on the previous slide. This is the circular in spiral, and then this is the head-on run. And because they're separated fairly far apart, but also because they're not using conformally f flat initial data, the spin can decrease by very small amounts, even when the initial spin's pretty big. And so you can actually do evolutions of, of binaries where the spin is point, let's say 0.97 here, which is, which is beyond the absolute highest spin that you could hope to do in the, using the conformally flat data. So this motivates trying to uh, push these more realistic versions of these evolutions where I haven't pushed the holes far apart to make things easier to evolve. And that's what I wanted to say just a little bit about next, because this is still very much a work in progress. The main issue that comes up is this issue of excision. Let me say a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, spectral methods in particular are very fussy, and they like the solutions to be nice and smooth. But any code wants the solution to be finite. So, so if here is some imaginary cartoon, this is a cartoon of the computational domain, and here are your two black hole horizons, not to scale, of course then lurking inside them are these singularities, which a computer sees like this and just doesn't like and will, will crash if you get something like this. So what we do is uh, we adjust our computational domain to cut out the regions uh, inside the horizons that contain the singularities so that we can do the evolutions. Because these horizons are moving, because they're dynamical, the excision surface can't just be the horizon itself. It has to be inside the horizon. If you try to put this excision surface too close to the horizon and then the horizon starts to move inward, then the only way to keep evolving would be to ex extrapolate. And extrapolation is sort of a four-letter word in numerical relativity. Um, yeah, you, basically, you would just lose too much, you would just lose a lot of accuracy that way. So in order to do the evolution, we need this excision surface far enough inside the horizon that the horizons are free to oscillate however they want, but also far enough out that you don't have problems with data getting gigantic as you get near the singularity. Okay. But the trickiness of cutting out these uh, excision surfaces is now you don't just have an outer boundary far away where you're asymptotically flat, but you also have boundaries in here at the excision surface. And you have to think carefully about, well, do I need to put boundary conditions there to make this, uh, the evolution a well-posed problem now? So to picture how to think about this, uh, it's easier to just picture a one-dimensional wave equation. So this is just some line, and here these are dashed lines are the boundaries of your grid. So if you have some wave that's traveling to the left, you need a boundary condition on this side, but you don't need a boundary condition on this side, because uh, well the boundary condition needs to say what, what waves are coming onto your grid from outside where your code doesn't know anything about it. But the wave is free to travel along, and it can travel right out of the grid and you don't necessarily need a boundary condition there. Similarly, if you have a wave coming in from this, this side, this wave, is, this wave is incoming on the left, but outgoing on the right. So you would need a boundary condition there. So basically, for these excision surfaces, you need a boundary condition if there's any waves coming up out of the excision surface. But when you're inside black holes, you, uh, it can be that all of the, all of the different wave modes are going downwards and going down the hole. Uh, because you're inside a horizon. And so ideally, what we'd like to do with these uh, excision surfaces is uh, choose them so that there never are any upgoing waves so that you never have to apply a boundary condition because you just let everything fall down the hole and fall off the grid because you don't, re you don't really uh, care what's inside the horizons because you can't observe it. So uh, the technical... Uh, the technical thing I'm talking about when I talk about these upgoing and downgoing wave modes is the characteristic speeds of the associated with the characteristic fields of the variables you're evolving. And the w when I plot them, uh, the, I'm going to say that modes that are outgoing or going down the hole are positive and waves that are coming up so that you would need a boundary condition are negative. So why is this hard? Okay. So this is a plot of, of uh, on this horizontal axis I'm showing the inner radius of a one-parameter family of excision surfaces for a single black hole. So I'm just taking a Kerr black hole. This is analytic data. And I'm ex putting an excision surface at various places. And I'm plotting what the minimum of the 
wave speed, this minimum characteristic speed is on the excision surface. If this is positive, then, uh, then you don't need any boundary conditions on the excision surface. You can just evolve it. And if this is negative, then there's stuff trying to come up out of the excision surface. So the zero is this horizontal dashed line right here. So outside the horizons, way over here, the characteristic speeds are negative, but that's what you expect because waves are able to travel to infinity from starting outside the horizon. This blue curve is the curve for spin zero. And, uh, and you see the characteristics, the speeds go through zero right at the horizon. And then everywhere inside the horizon, these speeds are nice and positive. And so you could put your excision surface pretty much anywhere inside the horizon and do your evolution. And you don't have to worry about this problem of, of uh, needing a boundary condition on the excision surface. For spin point five, the same basic story starts out to be true, but then the, the speeds turn around again. And for spin 0.95, there's just a very small region uh, where the characteristic speeds are positive. This vertical dashed line is the outer horizon, and this dashed line is the inner horizon for a black hole with spin 0.95. And uh, so the characteristic speeds are negative outside the horizon. They're positive for a region inside the horizon, but, not, but they're pretty, still pretty close to zero, and then they shoot back off and they're incoming again once you get well inside the inner horizon. So this is just for analytic initial data. This is a, the, uh, for real black hole simulations, these curves aren't fixed because the horizon's oscillating and changing in time, and that makes it even harder. So, uh, so when you're doing excision at these very high spins, this is what makes it tricky. You have to find a surface so that at any given time, you're in some region where you actually don't have to try to say what waves are trying to come up out of the inner horizon or something. None of this is astrophysically interesting at all. This is just a, a, numerical, prob a numerical problem because you don't re you're not astrophysically interested in what's inside the horizon because you can't ever see it. Okay, so before I talk about this current status of evolutions with high spins, spins 0.95, let me say something about uh, the evolutions with spins of 0.5 because these are easier. Oh, sorry, I'll go back. Yeah. Um, so, like, so for us, we're trying to say it's like all like collapsing matter. Mm -hmm. And there's this usual story that if you, you do a realistic collapse of anything, the form of spinning black hole, it actually is not in your horizon. Hmm. Now, does that, would it be possible that if you just want to produce the form as in getting... I mean, that's sort of an interesting... That's sort of an interesting idea. You have to set up the, the matter so that uh, the final spin of the black holes were still what you wanted. But, uh, and it turns out, especially for our spectral codes, simulations with matter are still quite a bit more difficult than simulations in vacuum. But in principle, I'll, yeah, I mean, it sounds plausible, but it, I think it'd be difficult in the short term for us to, to implement it. Uh, any other questions before I go on? Uh, I was just yeah. wondering, um, so this is, uh, based upon time hypersurface choices. And so um, I assume this is not possible, and it's easy to show that it isn't possible. Instead of excision, how about having an extremely warped time? So it's along the lines of what we just heard, yeah. where uh, essentially um, you know, the clocks are way, way, way back yeah. at uh, what would have become the singularity. And, uh, and so you have this incredibly distorted hypersurface. Yeah. And so that means that you would be, obviously, you have problems dealing with it, but you're essentially, um, instead of excision, you're doing sort of almost, well, it's not gravitational softening, but sure. sort of pushing things way, way Yeah. So something like that is actually, <coughs> if I understand what you're saying right, that's actually what most groups that do evolutions do. They don't do excision the way I'm describing yeah, here. Yeah, the, yeah. the finite yeah. difference yeah. curves yeah. use this uh, moving puncture approach. Okay. And they choose this special gauge so that, uh, so that basically uh, uh, it's sort of like, uh, the, uh, so, so the coordinates start moving away from the singularity in the, ch in the choice of coordinates they've made. So basically uh, they don't have to cut out this big region. The singularity just starts at a point that isn't on the grid, and then very quickly all the grid points by themselves m stay well away from it, and they sort of excise themselves, and then you don't have to worry. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. more to the point. So you have this really complicated situation where you yes. have that um, a positive uh, velocity region being uh, yeah. you know, just grazing. Yeah. And so to actually get that in a dynamical situation, yeah. it seems to me that you need a different technique than uh, a standard 
Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, that, so that's the thing. So I'm, yeah, so the standard excision technique isn't what most people are doing, but we don't, we haven't yet figured out how to use this gauge that they use in our spectral code. And we still want to use the spectral code because of the advantage it gives us in the resolution, I guess. But, but yeah, uh, uh, I would love to be able to figure out a way to not have to do this. This is, I'm just saying right now, uh, for our spectral code, we don't know how to do anything else. But I'm, and maybe I've made the case even a little stronger than it might, it maybe should have been because uh, at least for, for some, re maybe not extremal, but some reasonably sized spins, excision is not a problem. This is a simulation where the spins are 0.5. I showed this simulation at lunch today. And uh, the spins just stay 0.5, but they're in opposite directions, so the final hole has a spin of zero. Um, but the final hole also is still really deformed. And we're able to evolve this with uh, excision just fine. Also, those, uh, I was, those evolutions I showed earlier that did uh, an, a couple orbits at large separations with spins 0.9 three and 0.97, those also used excision. And so it's, I don't want to say it's impossible, I'm just trying to say it's tricky. And it might start to get very difficult at very high spins. Okay, one other thing I want to highlight about this movie here that's looking at the scalar curvature. During the plunge, you can see uh, the shape is, at early times is dominated by the spin. There's a bulge on the equator and it, it's squashed at the poles. But right before the merger, you also can see a tidal bulge growing that points from one black hole to the other. And this is not some coordinate effect. This is the, because this is the scalar curvature, which is a geometric definition of the shape. Then after the horizon forms, it's got this dumbbell shape where it's bulging on the, where it's bulging on the ends and squashed in the middle. But then it very quickly r relaxes down to something with constant scalar curvature because it's a sphere. So. This is, the first, this is the first movie where I've been able to see both the spin and the tidal deformation. Okay, let me, let me go on. Okay, so here's the story about this excision with the spin, this spin 0.95 run. That's at the exact same separation as that spin 0.5 run. It's not working yet. You know, I can't evolve this all the way to merger, but let me tell you what happens. This is a plot of the characteristic speeds on the excision surface. So it's okay for a little while. Uh, merger is going to happen at about the same time because... Uh, so the holes are just falling together and the only effect of the spin is to drag them in the, the direction normal to most of their motion. So they're going to fall together around time 89 in code units and here, uh, and here it makes it about a quarter of the way before. Uh, and actually, this is a slightly old graph. Uh, you, this basically just continues linearly down to zero. So you run into trouble around time 26. So a bit more than a quarter of the way to merger before you run into trouble. But there are ways to work around this without complete, completely abandoning excision, or at least that's our hope. So one thing to try is changing the coordinates. This is one example where I changed the coordinates so they're almost exactly the same, except I kept the coordinates moving so that the minimum radius of the horizon never changed. That's not the kind of thing you want to do in the long term, maybe, but, uh, but initially, but this is a, lets me evolve quite a bit farther. Instead of dying around 26, this run dies at time 40. And that's, uh, that's more than a third of the way to merger. And this is, was of just the first coordinate change that I tried. It's, it's, uh, it's not the best. And so it might be that by choosing some clever way of moving your coordinates by hand, you can, you can try to make manually what things like the moving puncture codes with their, uh, with their particular gauge conditions get automatically and cause the coordinates to move in such a way that, that you can do excision. Um, but, uh, so this is still work in progress. Uh, this is the longest evolution at, at this close separate, at this realistic initial separation with the spin point on five that I've got so far. I'm still, still working on this. But one other thing that I've tried is once the characteristic speeds hit zero, I've been telling you how that's bad because the problem isn't well posed anymore because I haven't put a boundary condition and I have no idea what boundary condition I should put on the excision surface. But what if you just don't put a boundary condition there and just keep the evolution going? I decided to try this because I wanted to show you a plot of how that's such a disaster and this, you know, the error in the simulation blows up right away and the simulation crashes immediately because that's what I thought would happen. But when I actually tried to do it, that's not what happened. So I'm showing three curves here. The green curve is the separation of the two black holes. This is it just the coordinate separation using, uh, for the spin point five run. So they fall together along this parabola. Uh, this white curve is the same 
as uh, the, the red run over here, this just runs a quarter of the way to merger or so. And you can see that uh, its trajectory follows this arc very similarly. And this is because spin only has a really tiny correction to the longitudinal motion. It's mostly just dragging the holes in the nor normal to, their, to, to their, the direction they're plunging together. This red curve is just a continuation of the white curve. The characteristic speeds are not positive on the excision surface, and I just didn't worry about it. Uh, I put a, just some trivial boundary condition there that just doesn't do anything. The characteristic fields just do whatever they do. And uh, this was able to evolve. Uh, th this also is a little bit out of date. I've been able to evolve this farther than the green curve, I've, than the green curve, so up to about time 45 in these units. I've only done this at one resolution, so I mean this is very shady, and there's, it's entirely possible that this d doesn't converge, but you get problems at high resolutions or any number of things. But I was really surprised that this run didn't just die right away. So besides working on changing the coordinates, which is the main way that I hope to be able to still use this excision method in the short term, uh, I'm also going to try some r runs where I just don't worry about it and see if, uh, and if, if it turns out that this, this isn't just taunting me, but it's really true that you can get away with uh, evolutions with, without strictly keeping the characteristic speeds uh, outgoing, then that would make my job a lot easier. Uh, I could, after I saw this, I could try to make up some reasons of why it might be true. This, the characteristic speeds never get that, that negative. They sit around 10 to the minus 4, and they're sitting inside a black hole. And so maybe, so there's some intermediate, inter, there's some region where anything that tries to come onto your domain isn't going to be, a, it's not going to be able to get outside of the horizon. So, uh, but before I saw this graph, I would have said, no, that's, that's crazy. This is, this is not going to be stable in, in general. So I don't know. But I wanted to show this to you because this is sort of the very latest results for, uh, for trying to evolve. So, it's a little back step. so yeah. um, the people that use the puncture methods, uh, when you try, it, it, you're using an a expansion in the basis of yes. spectrum methods. Um, and the puncture method has presumably pretty extreme distortions. And so the question is, uh, does that then compromise the projection onto the spectral coefficients because it's too distorted and you would essentially need to have much yes. higher uh, well, so what expansions I, or, and this yeah. is actually what I was getting at, sure. is maybe um, there is sort of a functional form to take out yeah. before you do the spectral expansion. I mean, so there are lots of yeah. uh, alternate ways to go about it, but it, it seems that they would be making such an extreme thing that yeah. you're sort of forcing the issue by requiring mm -hmm. a, uh, a, a essentially a spectral resolution. Sure. Device. So I'm not sure I can com completely see what you're saying, but I can say that uh, for the, so certainly the finite difference codes are using these rectangular grids of points, and so a deformed horizon that is is, is harder for them to resolve. And the high spin evolutions that I talked about before, even at 0.93, they had a lot of difficulty using all the resources, computational resources that they had getting, uh, getting adequate uh, resolution. For the spectral methods that I'm using here, what I actually do is I don't use, is I choose spectral functions that, are, that, approximate, as well, that approximate as well as I can think of the geometry. So for instance, near the black holes, I don't use spherical harmonics. I use spherical harm well, I use spherical harmonics, but I deform the spheres so that they have the shape of the curved horizon, so I need fewer basis functions to get the same accuracy. So yeah, I'm not sure I completely understood your question. No, but, I, but I mean I we do change the, the uh, yeah. an yeah. interior uh, uh, the, the requirement of sort of radial quote unquote high right. frequency would, would be necessary in order to get the complications of what's yeah. happening. Uh, when you're trying to excise by a function method. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think I just want to chat with you more afterwards about that, because I, I think I'd have to think about it some more. But, uh, okay, so I think I want to go on. It looks like I've only got three minutes to say the last thing I wanted to talk about. This is the project I'm, the project I'm actually working on with Harold, which is this problem of time steps. So let me just say briefly why this is a problem. Um, when you have an in-spiral, the black holes are doing a bunch of orbits, and the time scale of an orbit is maybe on the order of a thousand times the mass of the black hole. The farther apart you start the black holes, the longer this time scale is, and the more orbits you have to do. During the ring down, the time scale is much shorter. Maybe it's on the order of the mass of the black hole. These are the quasi-normal frequencies. But 
the time that it takes light to travel between the two closest grid points at the high resolutions I'm using is like m over 100. It's really small. And ordinarily, uh, when you and ordinarily, you don't expect numerical codes to be stable unless the time step is smaller than this time, which is this. This is called this current limit. And the, this, this just says, uh, heuristically, if the grid points aren't in causal contact, then your run will be unstable because the grid points don't know what the ne their neighbors are doing. In practice, we actually are able to, uh, just using our ordinary techniques, we're able to take a, a slightly larger time step, maybe a factor of two or three, but certainly, but not more than that, uh, times this time scale. But still, that th this is much, much smaller than what you would like. The physical time scales are so much longer that you're wasting a lot of computational time uh, just taking all these tiny time steps. We take thousands and thousands of time steps to do an orbit when things are changing much more slowly just to keep the code stable. And we would love to be able to not have to do this. So there's another kind of evolution that you can do. Uh, uh, so instead of explicit evolutions, I'll say what these mean on the next slide. Doing, you can do an implicit evolution that lets you bypass this limit in principle. And uh, Harold and Stephen Lau uh, and, uh, at New Mexico and I have been looking at trying to apply this idea to black hole evolutions. This, from now on, I'm only talking about single black hole evolutions. Okay, so the basic idea of how this works is you could imagine you've got some variables and you write your solution, your variables you're solving for is some vector u and the, there's one component per variable. Mm. In uh, GR, you've got a whole bunch of them. I'm not even going to say what they are. Um, and you can, and you, your generic first order evolution equation is the time derivative of those functions, of those variables is equal to some function. Okay. So in order to solve this on a computer, you discretize this and you say there are several discrete times you're solving at. And you have the solution at time t tn and you want to know the solution un plus one. There's some algorithm that tells you how to get that by taking some combination of the source term at various intermediate times, th these stage times. So this i is running over the number of s, the number of stage times. So here I'm showing in blue all these intermediate times where I've highlighted one of them in a lighter blue. Mm -hmm. So by compute, basically what you do is, is uh, you use these equations down here to compute the value of your variables at some, at a series of intermediate times, and then plug those up into the green equation, take some combination of those in order to step from one to the next. Now, most of the details of these equations are not important for, the, for what I want to say. All I want to say is this process of computing u at all these intermediate, the variables at all these intermediate stage values. What I mean by these explicit evolutions, the way we normally do it, is that, say, that this second term is zero, and these coefficients uh, are zero except uh, when j, when j is, uh, well, these coefficients are zero Except for, uh, except for the, slight, the, the stages j that are earlier. So all this means is that in order to compute the next stage, uh, go to i plus 1, all you need to know is the value of u at the previous stage times. You don't need to know what it is now or later. And so this means that one by one, you can algebraically build up the value of your variables at these intermediate times. The idea of the implicit equations is you relax this slightly so that uh, the coefficients can involve the thing you're solving for. And so they still don't involve any of the future stages, but now instead of just having a simple equ algebraic equation, you have some implicit equation that you have to solve in order to construct the variables at the next step. And this turns out to become some elliptic equation. So what this means is you're solving elliptic equations at a bunch of, at all, a bunch of these intermediate times every time you take a time step. And heuristically, uh, elliptic equations uh, are solu give you solutions over an entire domain. They're, they're not causal. You can solve for the whole, say, the whole initial spatial slice at once. And so, heuristically, that might give you some idea why uh, you might not have to worry as much about uh, the adjacent time slices being in causal contact with each other. Okay, so I've gone through that really quickly because uh, I'm out of time. I just want to show you the result. And uh, so far, the result is I'm able to take a single perturbed black hole. It starts out as a Schwarzschild black hole, no spin, so the scalar curvature is constant. I hit it with a wave, and the wave causes the scalar curvature to ring up and ring back down. And I'm evolving this using this new, these new implicit methods. 
So this, this movie here is very simple. All it does, the horizon rings a little bit and settles down. And let me show you the current status of this. This is the last thing I want to show. Uh, what I'm plotting on this axis is time, and I'm plotting the error, basically. These, these are how, uh, how badly the, the solution violates the Einstein equations, basically. And that's the vertical axis. And then this last axis is how big of a time step I'm taking uh, in terms of this cur current time scale. So ordinary explicit evolutions uh, would only be stable for this current time around one or two, but this axis is going all the way up to 100. It turns out, using this implicit method, if you try to take a time step that's too small, the result is unstable. These errors blow up. And, s and these errors over here are blowing up when you take a time step that's actually comparable to this frequency of the black hole's oscillation. And the, res the curves in the middle are stable for a, w for a while. They last uh, quite a bit longer the times than the actual physics. The wave stops relaxing around time 70. They, and these things last quite a bit longer before they die. I'm using a pretty naive outer boundary condition, and the outer boundary is pretty close. And so one reason why I think these might die in the long term is has nothing to do with the time step. It could just have to do with the fact that I'm not properly handling the waves going, going out and coming in at the boundary. And that's something I would need to check. Uh, but no, this is also work that's really still in progress. But I just wanted to show you this graph to say that this is, a, this is a case where we have a black hole with real dynamics where we are able to take an evolution at least uh, quite a bit longer than the dynamics last uh, using, uh, like this green curve here is taking a time step that's uh, about 50 times the, the light travel time between the closest grid points. So this is, this is a, a just to try to motivate this project and say that there's some hope that it might work in the end. So I think I want to quit there and I'd be happy to answer any more questions. Sure, I should I, I should have mentioned that. I just was running out of running out of time. But yeah, I should have mentioned that. And you also plan to take a chocolate for dinner tonight. You can join us with the dinner.